Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Marianne Wolf. Teachers are the backbone of society. They inspire, motivate, and educate the next generation, which is why recruitment and retention are fundamental when it comes to our teachers. Here to talk more about this topic are Jenny Bryan, the 2021 Southeast Regional Teacher of the Year, Representative Jeffrey Elmore, and Charlene Pittman, the Assistant Superintendent of Edgecombe County Schools. I'd like to welcome to the show, Jenny Bryan, who is the Southeast Regional Teacher of the Year and a Social Studies teacher at South Brunswick High School. Jenny, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Would you please tell us a little bit about your journey in deciding to be a teacher? Sure, well, um, as I reflect back on that journey, it's, it's not really a super sweet or magical one. Um, in fact, I think I was really probably discouraged by some of the adults in my life early on from pursuing um, a teaching job. Except for my high school guidance counselor, she mentioned teaching fellows, but I actually said no thank you before I even gave her the chance to really talk about that. When I enrolled in UNC Chapel Hill, I knew I wanted to be a history major and I would just kind of figure out the rest later. And I got to 2007 when it was time to graduate and still wasn't really quite sure what I wanted to do. I'd had a really enjoyable honors thesis experience and so was drawn to historical research, uh, but also felt compelled to do something working more directly with others. And so um, I came across a quote in a book that said, you know, your great joy or your deepest gladness, where that meets a world's great, great need, you know, that's, that's what you're called to do. That's, that's where, where you should spend your time moving forward. And so with that, you know, I have this great joy and great gladness that I get from history. Um, and I just felt really compelled that there was a need for, for good educators in the classroom. And so I found myself um, at Wake Forest working on my master teacher fellow. Would you tell us a little bit more about what um, made you stay in teaching and want to still be doing this? Um, I've had the privilege to teach at two different schools. So started here at South Brunswick, returned, but I wasn't South Central High School in Pitt County for four years. And uh, I think being surrounded by just wonderful, wonderful colleagues at, at both schools has really um, had a lot to do with, with me enjoying my profession. Um, the professional development opportunities I've had in these two districts um, have been significant. Um, and I really do feel that I get that, um, that reward from working with students and preparing our students um, to, to be our future leaders, to be civically engaged. Um, that I find tremendously rewarding. As you know, um, we do in North Carolina have a teaching shortage. Um, I think all of us are nervous about how COVID-19 has probably even made that worse, but we had it before. And one of the challenges is definitely recruiting teachers, but also retaining them. And I wonder if you have some recommendations on how we can retain teachers, but also very open to hearing your suggestions about recruitment after that. Here I am, you know, 11 years into this profession. And I'm so grateful that I've, I made my way here into the classroom. Um, but honestly, like I kind of mentioned before, um, I think I spent some time trying to avoid the classroom because I knew that there was a lack of respect and lack of resources in many cases for educators. I'll never forget. Once I had decided to become a teacher, I shared that with someone from back home, someone who I really looked up to and respected. And that person looked at me and said, you're too smart to be a teacher. You should be a doctor or a lawyer. I was fearful that the benefits of teaching would not meet up to the pressures and frustrations. Had I had been given more positive messaging early on, I think I would have decided to become a teacher a little bit sooner than I did. And so when I reflect on my own journey into education, it's not really surprising that we, uh, given the current narrative that's surrounding public education today, that there's a teacher pipeline problem. In my first few years of teaching at South Brunswick, we had a phenomenal group of young, talented, effective, energetic educators. Within a few years, eight of those teachers left the classroom altogether, left education altogether, and seven moved on into either higher ed or administrative roles. So on average, I would say those teachers had about six years of experience. That's just about 90 years of experience out the door. And that's a problem. In terms of recruitment, I think that we as a society have to change the way we talk about education. We have to respect the work that our teachers do. We have to trust them to be professionals. 
I think we as teachers though have a role to play. I need to tell my students, my students need to hear me say, hey, I enjoy my job. You are smart. You are so talented. You would make a great teacher. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be some really frustrating experiences that you have, but I will support you and I would be honored to have you as a colleague. I think we as teachers need to start promoting our profession in that way. Um, but I then have a responsibility um, and our state has the responsibility to make this field um, as welcoming um, and as professional as possible. I would feel horrible if years later students came back to me to say, Ms. Bryan, why did you tell me to be a teacher? I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of this. So it's my obligation too, and it's our state's obligation um, to create a professional environment and a well compensated environment for our future teachers if we want to relieve the pipeline problem that we have. Um, I'm so encouraged to hear about the Grow Your Own program taking place in Edgecombe County. Um, they are investing in and saying to their current students, their current high school students, hey, you'd make a great teacher, join our teacher scholar program and then come back here and join us in this district. I'm also hopeful that this uh, teaching fellows program will be re-strengthened to what it once was, that there'll be expanded teaching fellow positions available, um, expanded, uh, that the program will be expanded to other campuses beyond the five where it's currently being offered. Um, I'm really hopeful, um, but, but do know that there's some things need to happen at the state level, as well as the district level, and as well as the classroom level to really uh, work to relieve the teacher pipeline problem. I wonder if you have any other specific policy recommendations that you would like to share. Getting to the teacher retention issue, you know, I just spoke a lot about recruitment, but in terms of retention, um, I believe there's kind of three key things that need to be focused on. Number one, creating advanced teaching roles throughout the state. There's been some great pilot programs happening in places like Pitt County where I was. Um, they've had some great work done and I'd like to see that um, trans forward into other districts um, and continued throughout the state. We have to prioritize teacher wellness, whether it's their physical wellness by making teachers a vac uh, priority in vaccinations or our emotional wellness or just our professional wellness. We have to prioritize staff wellness if we are to be most effective for our students. And then lastly, competitive compensation. You know, we live in a society that abides by the idiom, you get what you pay for. But for some reason, we don't necessarily think that's true for education. To keep highly effective and qualified teachers in every classroom, we have to, um, we have to pay them competitively. And so I'm hopeful that in this budget season that the governor and the General Assembly will work together um, and see through on the Landro short-term action plan to start raising teacher salaries by at least an average of 5% in 2021. Having a qualified and well-prepared teacher in every North Carolina classroom is something that I'm gonna to continue to champion as the Burroughs Welcome Fund Southeast Regional Teacher of the Year. I've got skin in this game because I love this profession. I love the people in this profession that I get to work with and the students that I teach. And I also have a three and a half year old daughter who will be entering North Carolina public school soon. And every day she is a reminder of why we cannot afford to fail on this for her and for every other student in North Carolina. Thank you so much for being here. After the break, we will be joined by Representative Jeffrey Elmore and Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources in Edgecombe County Schools, Charlene Pittman. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. I'd like to welcome to the show Representative Jeffrey Elmore and Edgecombe County Schools Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Charlene Pittman. And I should also mention that Representative Elmore is also an elementary school art teacher. Um, and Charlene Pittman also has a background in being a teacher and a principal. And so we're just thrilled with your current roles, but also all that you bring to this conversation. We know that in North Carolina, we do have a teaching shortage, a teacher shortage. We know that the pandemic is probably gonna make that even larger. What are some of the things you think we should be doing so that we can recruit more teachers into the profession? Our, our numbers have improved uh, with the report that we get back on why teachers are leaving, uh, why teachers come into the profession. And I think a lot of that's driven by um, the pay structure and how we have worked to deal with teacher pay and uh, especially targeting the 
beginning of the scale because we were having um, a lot of problems getting them in the door, uh, especially in our more urban systems. Um, our teaching fellows program is back. It's, it's very specialized though with hard to staff areas. Uh, I think that's more of a um, highlight um, type program. It's, it's not going to uh, magically fix all of the pipeline issues. Um, we've looked at different efforts of uh, doing signing bonuses to help. Uh, concern that I have with the rural areas are the older teachers. Uh, that for a rural area, we really need, let's say Mrs. Smith is in year 25 and she teaches uh, a math course. Uh, those are very difficult to fill in rural North Carolina. So we need to try to do some things to keep her uh, in the classroom as long as we possibly can. Charlene, I'd love to hear from you about recruiting. I know Edgecombe County has made some pretty significant efforts in this regard too. Sure. So one of the things that I would like to share is we so value our IHEs, like we're so committed to building those relationships with our local colleges and universities, because we believe that if we can make those relationships and if we can make those connections, that we can start to draw the talent into our school district, like during their student teaching experience. And hopefully that will flow over into actually becoming an employee with Edgecombe County Public Schools. I'd also like to share uh, that we are proud of like the teacher supplement that we offer and the supplement being the local dollars that are above and beyond the state salary uh, for our teachers is pretty, pretty competitive with those uh, immediately around us in our region. And so we're really happy about that. So between the relationships with the IHEs, uh, competitive supplements, Representative Elmore, you referenced the signing bonuses. And we do have a signing bonus here for those hard to fill areas such as exceptional children's program teachers, as well as secondary math and science. So those are just a few of the recruitment strategies for us. What are some of the efforts um, that you think we can do to also retain those teachers once we have them, including working conditions and compensation? The first thing that I would share would be support, support, support. Uh, during those beginning years, as teachers are coming in, it's so important to make sure that we have the mentor teachers in place, uh, the veteran teachers who can work alongside them, who can answer the questions that beginning teachers, you know, may have so that they know that they're not alone as they begin their professional experience. Um, in addition to the beginning teacher support program and having mentors, I would say that the professional development piece is huge and we're so excited regarding how we provide job embedded professional development for our teachers. So those are just a few of the things that we look at as far as retaining our teachers once we've been fortunate to get them here. And Representative Elmore, you have been teaching for a while and so I'm curious to hear personally, like what are some of the things that have really impacted you in continuing in your teaching path, but also what are things that you think as a legislature and a state we might be able to do to increase our retention? Sure, I, I, I'm um, in my 20th year, so I, I used to, uh, when I first started, all of the ones in the school, you know, they had 30 years plus, and there were few of us that were um, my age, and uh, then I'm, I've turned out, I'm one of the older ones in the building because the way that it cycles through, um, it, you know, for, for me, I, I think that uh, things like she's talking about um, that they are doing are very important. Uh, the conditions of the school, things like scheduling, uh, trying to work with people uh, on a school-based level. Uh, I think the relationship of the uh, employee with the principal is critical too. Uh, and those relationships build, uh, building with the school leader, uh, because if you uh, do not have the... Um, confidence with your school leader, uh, that makes the working conditions very difficult uh, on a teacher. And then they feel like that they're on an island. And, and that's the last thing that uh, we really need to uh, have. Uh, the schools, in my opinion, over 20 years have become a whole lot more collaborative. Uh, uh, when, when I first started, that wasn't as much of a priority. Uh, it was basically, can you do the job and you get put in the room and that, that was it. Uh, we don't see that environment anymore. It, it's very much uh, team collaboration, grade level collaboration, collaboration on a uh, system level, 
when you're trying to meet up with your colleagues that are in the same subject matter, same grade level, uh, to um, find uh, try to address some of those problems. Those kind of things help keep your em uh, employee motivated and moving forward. And, and of course, pay is always an issue too. You, you know, your time, effort, all the work that you're doing, do you feel like that you're getting uh, what you feel like you need out of it? And uh, that's where the private sector comes in and puts pressure on this. Uh, you know, they start asking the question, can I go work for such and such and make $10,000 more? Or, or can I go work for such and such and have more flex time during my day? Uh, th those pressures um, are, exist and, and we have to be aware of them and, and not think that uh, education is just in a bubble. Uh, when it comes to the, the pressure of keeping an employee. Charlene, one of the things that we also hear a lot about is that we want to increase the diversity of our teaching workforce. We know how important that is for all of our students, but then also addressing culturally responsive um, teaching and learning. And I just wanted to give you a minute to talk about that a little bit and share what you're thinking. One of the things here uh, in Edgecombe County, we have a very intentional focus on equity. Uh, in the school district. You know, most of the times when you look at strategic planning and the focus, you have your vision, but we've been very intentional about our focus on equity and how do we make sure that the biases that we all have, whether they're implicit or explicit, like we're aware of them so that we have a firsthand knowledge of how it impacts students in the classroom. So when it comes to being culturally responsive, I think a part of it for us is the self-awareness, know thyself, whether you're at the leadership level at the district or the school, and then school leaders being able to have the same conversations with teachers. So culturally responsive, uh, for us would be, again, that awareness of those biases that we all have, how are we intentional in becoming aware of those and addressing those so that students are not adversely infected, affected. Thank you so much. And that intentionality is so important. And Representative Elmore, you know, you all just share again and again why our teachers are so important. We know that they are the number one school related factor that impacts student outcomes. And as we look at this legislative session, I'm really curious to hear what you're thinking about, but also knowing that in the Leandro case, this is absolutely an area that we lift up in terms of needing a well-qualified, well-prepared teacher for every single student. So what do you see happening in the legislative session and what do you hope will happen this year? I, I think we still are whittling away. You, you know, you can't eat the elephant all at one time. You have to do it a bite at a time. Uh, on uh, the issues of our pipeline. Uh, we're working on the teacher training component, making sure that our schools of education are, are properly ex exposing the future teacher to what it's, to make it more like what it is like, if that makes any sense, to where they are getting those kind of experiences to where they're not in shell shock when they go into the school. Uh, we're working on that end. Uh, we've had efforts with, uh, TGNC, the website uh, that is trying to make a centralized uh, HR tool for somebody that is interested. Uh, we're continuing to look at licensure issues to make sure, especially for our heavy uh, military uh, areas, to where when someone is moving in, that their partner uh, may have a certification in another state. How can we utilize that labor pool? Uh, I think compensation will still continue to be looked at. Uh, what role does that play? Uh, what things can we can, uh, do for the older teachers, but also what are some ways that we can help the younger batch of teachers to, to retain them uh, on both ends? So I, th I think all of that is on the table because even though we are doing a lot of action right now at the General Assembly, it feels more like May to me, but uh, it's because of the Corona relief bills and things. We, uh, we just have a lot going on. But for the budgetary process, we're still very early in it. We just got revenue projections um, last week. So uh, we're still very um, early in our long budget process. We certainly look forward to seeing all that comes out. And that's a really good reminder, Representative Elmore, while it feels so heavily on certain areas right now and not others. But um, you know, continuing to share the good information, hearing from people. Uh, like Charlene, but also your own experience, hoping that we can really move things, um, I guess, accelerate some of the movement we've had for our educators. So 
thank you so much for being with us today. Um, your perspective is so important and you both bring such rich perspectives and experiences to this conversation. And after the break, this week's final word. When you think about your own education, it is likely that a particular teacher comes to mind who made a significant difference for you. I quickly think of Mr. Keenan, Ms. Mills, and others that helped shape how I think and learn and what I wanted to do. Teachers provide our children with the academic, social, and emotional learning opportunities that they need to become global citizens who have the tools necessary to succeed in college and career. Research confirms that teachers are the number one school-related factor in impacting student learning outcomes. For that reason, we must ensure that we have a qualified and well-prepared teacher in every classroom, which requires us to provide teachers with the profession, working conditions, and resources they need. As the daughter of a teacher and a former teacher myself, I know how incredibly challenging the role can be. But today, it is even harder and the pandemic has exacerbated many of the inequities that our students and schools face. The ability to recruit and retain high quality teachers is critical, but North Carolina continues to experience considerable challenges in most grade levels and subject areas. Educator preparation programs in North Carolina have experienced declining enrollments of more than 50% since 2009. While students of color comprise over half of the total student population in our state, 80% of our teachers are white. Research has found that students of color have stronger academic and social emotional outcomes when they have same race teachers in their classrooms and all students are at a disadvantage by not having teachers of color. These teacher shortages are expected to grow with the pandemic. So how do we ensure that every child has access to a highly qualified and well-prepared teacher? Fortunately, there are many policy solutions and actions that we can take to make a positive impact in this area. The Leandro Short-Term Action Plan that addresses how we must invest in our public schools during fiscal year 2021 highlights several of these evidence-based approaches. We must increase educator compensation and create incentives to enable low wealth districts to attract and retain qualified and well-prepared teachers. As a means towards lifting North Carolina's teachers to a minimum, the national average, Let's raise pay for teachers and instructional support staff by at least 5% this year. We must also reinstate retiree health benefits for teachers and all state employees. New employees hired after January 1st, 2021 won't retire with state subsidized health care, and we must work to regain that important benefit. We must also work harder to increase the racial and ethnic diversity of North Carolina's qualified and well-prepared teacher workforce. The work resulting from the governor's drive task force has offered a clear roadmap that contains innovative practices to support this effort. We can support district-based grow your own recruitment programs like those in Edgecombe County and expand teaching fellows to include historically black colleges and universities. We must provide high quality mentoring and induction support for beginning teachers for their first three years to increase both their effectiveness and their retention. We must implement differentiated staffing models that include hybrid and advanced teaching roles and additional compensation to retain and extend the reach of high performing teachers to help bolster the teaching profession. To do this successfully, we need to be sure that systems have the resources to ensure their success and their sustainability. The teaching profession deserves to be just that, a profession. And we as a state have much work to do to elevate this essential role for our students, families, communities, and economy. Our teachers are highly educated and could pursue many other career paths, and we must start early and support those interested in pursuing education. Investing in our teaching candidates and current teachers is investing in the number one factor that impacts our student outcomes. We have the resources and we understand what it takes to recruit and retain high qualified and well-prepared teachers. That's all for today and we'll see you next week.